Welcome back to The Craft, where we explore what we're learning about the creative process. I'm Colby, and I'm here with my friend, Carter. And today we're talking about creative tools. Yes, talking about creative tools, and we'll jump right into it. And so kind of uh, the structure today, we're coming out of our series on the creative principles. And so we're back to kind of a normal structure. We'll talk about creative tools for a little bit, move into some practical application, do a quote of the day, and then close this up. So Perfect. Out. And I got to say, that was a fun series. Like, I really enjoyed doing those four episodes, man. Yeah, I'm, ex- I'm excited we have those out, and I'm sure we'll reference those a lot. And so if you haven't listened, head back, check them out. But today, we're talking about creative tools, and so we can jump right into it. The first place that I went for this kind of question, how is a tool different than a gadget? This is this was the original dichotomy that I was thinking because you know you know good workman doesn't blame his tools like we've heard that before, but at the same time it's like if you've ever tried to like get a screw out with a like without a screwdriver and you're trying to use a penny or something it's really hard to do things without the right tools and so there's mm-hmm. kind of two tensions there okay you can't blame your tools but at the same time you kind of need the right tools and so that kind of got me thinking about the difference between having a tool that you wield, that you use, that you're the agent behind it. And the tool is kind of neutral. So if you're using like a screwdriver or something, um, you know, it depends how you use it. It's pretty neutral. Whereas a gadget to me is like trying to get a shortcut to something. Like it's designed to, to help get you somewhere and replace something. And so here, here's a couple examples. I'll throw it out. That was kind okay. of the, the two difference. Okay. The agent uses a tool. The gadget is replacing something that you would do or giving a shortcut. The first place I went was like fishing. So this is a, okay. <laughs> probably a common place I'll go back to. But if you think about a rod and you cast it as being a tool, they also sell these self-casting like rocket like casters where Wait, you just really? press a button. Yeah, and your lure just flies out there. And so you pretty much just like shoot the lure around wherever you want it, (laughs) which is kind of hilarious. It's kind of awesome. Yeah. And so I was thinking, okay, if you've got a, you know, a fishing rod, you're using it. Like you're doing the action of casting. But what has happened with a gadget like this, like this self casting, like rocket launcher thing is you've taken out your place in casting. You've replaced the action of casting with a gadget that'll do it for you. And so another way I was thinking about it was thinking about Word, like using Word on a computer. Okay, I see that as a tool. It's like you're writing, you're using Word. But something like Grammarly, which I use, I like Grammarly, it's doing some of the proofreading for you. Right? Mm-hmm. It's designed to be a shortcut that identifies problems so that you don't have to go back right, and read closely and identify it yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, again, something's being replaced or your agency in it is being displaced onto something else. It's doing something for you. right? You're not the one that's using this tool. It's, it's somehow giving a shortcut to something that you would do. Okay, that, that that is a lot there. Does any of that make sense? Kind of like a tool versus a gadget? Or is there anything that like is going off in your mind that okay, maybe this is a place that you see that? I definitely see I see what you're saying now. Like whenever you first said that concept, I didn't catch on. Um but I th- I hear what you're saying. The the gadget replaces your agency. So it's like Grammarly. I'm actually seeing Grammarly like comments on this Google Doc right now. <laughs> it's like Grammarly is replacing my, my use of, uh, my skills in grammar kind of, and like my need to read every word. And it's just allowing me to, yeah, it's just like turning that into a a component. And I just kind of click, click all the button, all the words with the red, red underneath them. And and that's it, you know, and I don't have to, it takes away the thinking and the tool is like Google docs where I'm actually doing the writing or maybe even just my computer in general, where I'm sitting down to craft some pros. So and I and I thought of this too with a recent podcast with Andy Crouch who talked about a device versus an instrument. And he was talking about our phones. Yeah. Like, are we using them as mm-hmm. an instrument? And I think he likened instruments to like actual musical instruments where 
That guitar could do you know, incredible things in the right hands, whereas a device, if you just press play and it plays classical guitar music... You do incredible things in everyone's hands. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so I was kind of thinking along those lines. Yeah, that's interesting because it kind of gets into the idea that, in a way, it's like gadgets... Well, here's kind of a counter question for you. Like, can tools make you better at your craft? Because gadgets clearly can. Like, you can just hit the button and cast the reel, or you can just open the document and see your mistakes. And so that's like outsourcing all of the skill, right? But if you're the one like picking up the guitar, you can't outsource that. You have to learn how to press every note down. So, yeah, how much do you think that the tool can improve your skills, I suppose? That's a good question. And, you know, to stay abstract, maybe in an unhelpful way for a minute, there's a really interesting thinker, oh, Stiegler, I'm forgetting his first name. He talks about how technology, uh, with technology, we displace our knowledge. And so this happened to me the other day. I was trying to do something like long division. No, it was like long multiplication. And I was like trying to set it up and remember how to do it. It's like, I haven't done like longhand, like 59 times 32. Like I haven't done that like on a piece of paper in probably 15 years or something, or maybe not. Like it's been at least a decade since I've done that. Yeah. And like, cause I'm so used to using a calculator. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about how like within technology, we take the knowledge that we have and it gets displaced into technology. And so think about like a computer. I don't understand how my Mac works. I could not dr like give you a schematic of how the circuit board looks. I couldn't describe to you how it functions, but I use it. And so he talks about the tendency for us to have knowledge displaced. We don't have to think about how it works. I don't know how it works. I know how to use it, but I really don't know how it works. And so that was another yeah. layer to this where I think, of course, tools can be helpful and gadgets can be helpful in a way. But the difference that I was trying to tease out here is that I think a good tool is kind of neutral in a way of how we use it, mm -hmm. where you're bringing a lot to it. And the tool allows you to kind of manifest your ideas or to get the job done, whereas the gadget, you're kind of giving up some of your own idiosyncrasies or you're giving up some of your participation and so like that rocket launcher fishing lore like you're giving up the whole participation of doing a cast the timing yeah. the rhythm you're giving up something mm -hmm. and i think it's just helpful to be mindful of whether we're using gadgets or tools because you have to have tools you know, if we mm -hmm. go back to that opening tension, it's like you it's kind of really helpful to have the right tools. But at the same time, it is about what you bring to them. So I, that was kind of another digression there. Uh, but what do you think? Like, how do you think, if even with that opening tension of, is it the good craftsman doesn't need to have the right tools or he can use whatever? Or, you know, do we have to have tools? Where do, where do you land on that? Well, I found this quote this week. It said, if you only, if the only tool you have is a hammer, it's hard to eat spaghetti. David Allen. <laughs> and I uh -huh. thought that was pretty funny because it's like, okay, tools matter. Like you, like you said, like you can't get a screw out with a penny or it's very difficult to. And uh, so there's this aspect that I think there's even that quote from, uh, I think it's Abe Lincoln that like, if you ask me to cut down a tree, I'm going to spend the first you know, 75% of the time, just, just sharpening the ax. Why? Because it's a, it's a force multiplier. It's a lever. It can do much more than your arm could do, or, you know, your hands could do by themselves. And so I think like without, without a certain tool, you can't even do the, the craft that you're trying to do. And so that's like the minimum, like the minimum requirement for cutting down a tree is to have something sharp, like an ax or a saw. But then like, you don't have to have a chainsaw, you know? And so that's kind of the, or you don't have the best, you don't have to have the best brand of the ax in order to be successful. And I think something I've even heard my boss say is like, people like to spend, people like to spend money on tools or on stuff that they think, because they think, oh, this will make me better. 
and there's a level of that that's true, but then there's an aspect of it that's like you that peop, you're being sold a dream more than you're being than that might actually be realized, you know? Or it's kind of like yeah. you're being given the tool, but now you have to do something with that tool. It can help you get to where you want to go, but it can't do it for you, I feel like. Ooh, that's it. I think that's it. That's what I was trying to get at with gadget. A gadget's yeah. doing it for you. Right. I think that that might be close to exactly what I was thinking. And also, which is I not think, always bad. I was going to say, I use some gadgets because it's like, I don't want to spend my time on. Like a good example, Auto Tune. It's a plugin that tunes vocals very quickly. And I don't even, like some tuning tools require you to go through and tune every single note that someone sings. Auto Tune has different options. You can do that, or you can just set the key and set a couple settings and then it like does it for you. And it's, it might not be how I use things for the final song always, but it's like, it gets me 90% of the way there within sure. like 30 seconds. It's like, sure. I don't need to spend two hours. I just wanted the vocals to like not have that really wrong note <laughs> and that fix that problem for me. Same with Grammarly, same with, I guess a lot of different things, but there's kind of an aspect of like, I think it's okay to use gadgets whenever you're just not trying to work on that aspect of your craft. It's like, it's more about what you're delivering in the end and less about every, every single piece of how you got there. But and I'll throw a butt in there. There's this story that I heard recently of Steve Jobs. He delayed the production or release of one of the computer, the Apple computers, because the circuit board didn't look good enough. And obviously that's something that no one would see, but it goes back to this story in his childhood where his father helped him paint a fence, asked him to paint a fence. They painted this fence together and his dad said, we're going to make the back of this fence look even better or just as good as the front of this fence. And it was up against, you know, these like briars and woods and fields and no one was behind them. So no one would have seen that side of the fence. And so Steve was like, why are we going to do that? That's pointless. No one is going to see this. And his father said, but you're going to know about it and you're the one who made it and so do things even the parts of your craft that are not visible to other people with the same excellence and so there's even apparently there's even a macbook where all the team that made it stenciled in their name onto the back of the inside cover behind the screen where no one was ever going to see it but it was like this extra touch that they put inside the mac just because of that craftsmanship and so he also came back later and said real artist ship, which is kind of the inverse of that, like delaying a product because you have to deliver something. But I don't know that that's just some, some stories I've heard from Walter Isaacson recently in a podcast that I thought was really inspiring, but also just like something to think about. Like, it's like, do I want to lean on the side of shipping more? Or do I want to lean on the side of this like perfection and really striving to do something great? And rec- and like believing that there's importance in the details. I don't know, man. I think it's another artistic. Down the middle. Yeah, it's another artistic tension, I think, yeah. with that. And, you know, going back to the tool thing as well with like how we use it, I think you're right. Like there's, I think this example of like shipping and finishing, we can lay as a parallel with this tools, crucial tools don't matter, same sort of binary. Mm-hmm. One of the things, and maybe this will be kind of a transition too into some sort of practical things, but when I'm writing in Microsoft Word, I don't use any sort of Grammarly plugin or anything. I do on emails. Mm-hmm. Now, if I want to go back after I've proofread, I copy it from the document and I paste it into the Grammarly browser because I don't want this kind of AI influencing my word choice while I'm writing. So it's like a, it's like a conscious thing that I do mm. of my process is okay, I'm going to use what I think is a blank page tool, do my thing and then use this gadget for things that I've missed. Now with emails, I just I it's really helpful to have the plugin because yeah, I'm just trying to articulate something that's correct, right? And, and mm. moving quickly. And so I think again, like so many of these things, it's contextual how we're using it, where we're using it. Are we trying to make up for a lack of skill by getting a bunch of gadgets? Like, are you the fisherman out there with all the $500 gear and stuff, but 
you don't know the basics, right? This is in every single craft. Are you mm-hmm. the guy that went out and bought all the stuff but can't ski? Like that sort of thing, I mean, right? That That's a legitimate yeah, concern yeah. to have. Am I trying to fabricate skill through gadgets? But at the same time, right. it's not that they don't have a purpose. I really like Grammarly. It's a great gadget. I almost said tool. It might be a tool. <laughs> that's a debate too. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's attention. Like it depends yeah. how you're using these things. Yeah, that's a really good, really good thought, man. I I, lo- I think that gets that the way you put that into a, a picture of like someone who's bought all the fishing gear, like the top end, they've kind of poured like ten thousand dollars into their rig, and they show up, and it's like, dude, you have that brand, you have that, you're, oh my gosh, that thing is like six thousand dollars. Like, you know, you you see that person, and it's like okay, well, let's see what they've got. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. But, it, but then because that t- type of like uh, hyperbole, I guess, is in my head, I'm like buying tools can sometimes make me feel like, oh, am I becoming that or am I being that? I can just overthink it. Like it doesn't matter sure. if you buy a ton sure. of tools or you buy no tools. Like it just kind of comes down to working and getting better and like failure, honestly, like practicing yeah. and failing and practicing and failing. And it depends too. It's like yeah. a a world-class artist, classical guitarist is going to have a better guitar than I do. He yeah. should because he can, that tool brings something to what he can do, mm-hmm. right? The tool is he's using, he's the agent, right? He's the one that's sounding these chords and sounding these notes. And so in that way, the tool is like a, a supplement almost, or it, I don't know, because there is the situation where someone's mm-hmm. at the top of the craft and they've got the best tools and those things are perfect match, right? right? And again, that comes back to like how we're using them, you know, in that kind of sense. Yeah, I don't know. That seems that seems like it's kind of right. Yeah, I like that. So definitely curious. I think I know the answer to one. I think I know one of the answers you're going to give, but what are your favorite tools for writing? What was your what was your guess for one? Scrivener for sure. Winner. <laughs> that was the first one I wrote down. Perfect. Yeah, that that's one I really like. Check it out if you haven't checked out Scrivener. Can you give me context? Because I don't like I vaguely know what it is, but not sure. everyone might know what that is. Yeah, just a quick summary. Scrivener is really simple. I think its motto is like see the forest, don't get caught up in the trees or something like that. They've got a nice little idea. And basically, it's an application that allows you to visualize your paper by breaking it up into different sections. And so it's got like a sidebar on the side and you can, you know, write in a in a sidebar, make another column, move those columns around, move the paragraphs around. You can see them all on the screen set up. You can write little descriptions about what that paragraph's doing. I've used it for, you know, revision, I think is really helpful because you take every paragraph, you make it its own little section. You talk about what's going on in that paragraph. There's all sorts of different formats from screenplays to essays and articles that you can use. And it's just a really helpful way when you're working on big projects, you can put articles in there, you can put notes in there, you can basically compile all your information on one big document. And then it's really intuitive how to move that information around, how to move your writing around, how to organize notes and move things. It's just a really cool tool. And then after I kind of use it in this generative, creative way. I'll then transfer everything to Word, and that's when I'll like do citations oh. right and start really polishing it. And so I don't really polish things on Scrivener, but it's really helpful for like big picture, at our revision episode, global concerns. So it's really cool. So, so do you? Is it like a really tiny font when you're zoomed out and you're seeing like you you're seeing on one screen the whole paper or every page basically? Or so it'll break it up into like little squares for you. Which okay. give you, uh, if you put like a little, a like little synopsis of what's mm-hmm. going on in that that text or that document, you'll see all those little squares with the okay. title of that document and whatever kind of notes that you have on it, and so okay. it looks like a grid. It's really cool. Yeah, cool. check it on. There's, yeah, there's like check a check out some screenshots or something. Yeah, there's a cool. I think that they used to have a 14 day trial, and it wasn't 14 days. It was 14 days that you used it, which is kind of a nice thing. So, oh, cool. Yeah, it was a I nice. Like that. But yeah, definitely check out Scrivener if you do any sort of writing. Really helpful. Sweet. Any others you wrote down? 
How about you? You got one? Yeah. Fourth here. Dude, I kind of bounced around with ideas. I mean, really looking back at the last few years, like what's been the most consistent. It's kind of like, I guess everything kind of comes back to Ableton for music. That's my digital audio workstation or DAW that I use. And so that's where I come up with new ideas, you know, make entire songs, record vocals, do the mixing, do mastering, like all the stages of making a song, putting it together, coming up with chord progressions and drum beats and like with samples of drum sounds, stuff like that. All of that whole process just comes through Ableton. And it's, uh, I think it's like based in Europe where it's made. I'm not really sure, but it's, I, I would say originally it was like more of like a tool for like live performances and stuff like DJs and people with timing music with light shows and stuff like that. But over time it's been used more by a lot of producers and like, you know, you've probably, everyone's heard of GarageBand, Logic, Pro Tools. Those are kind of the more like famous DAWs. Ableton is very popular, but it's a little bit more like popular in electronic music, I feel like. And then more recently it's been getting more popular widely, but it's not like a niche tool at all, but it's been really a good tool for me to learn. And I've, I've messed around with Pro Tools some in college and I've used other DAWs, but I really do like Ableton. I think if I was going to learn another tool, it would be Pro Tools um, because that's been around since like the 80s and it's just a standard in almost every studio. Okay. So it's the most widely used DAW. So, but at the end of the day, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I got to hear at the end of the day. Well, I was going to say at the end of the day, I feel like it, it is a question a lot of people ask when they're kind of just getting started in music production, like, well, which DAW do you use? And I think, you know, opinions of a guy, <laughs> just opinions of a guy, but I think they all pretty much do the same thing. And so it's like, whatever works for you just stick with it. So sure. Part of me wants to learn Pro Tools for the reason I just said, but it's like, I can record, I can make music in this, I can export it. (laughs) What else do I need? You know, like, and all of these different tools integrate with the the same third party plugins that everyone uses. So like reverbs, delays, compression, any like auto tune, which I referenced earlier, all those plugins can be used on Logic, Pro Tools, Ableton. So it's like, really, it's kind of just like the main canvas and then you can put in all these other things. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's probably the biggest tool that I've used for probably six years, I think. That's that's great. And so one of the questions that I kind of had, this kind of goes back to our conversation, maybe you could sketch out, I know GarageBand is like the entry point, like comes on every Mac, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe talk about, okay, what would be the difference in like you trying to create something in GarageBand versus Ableton? Like what are those I don't know, attributes of this tool that's like you really like or that you can leverage. Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to like, okay, why, why Why use- Why wouldn't I just use garage? Yeah, well, I think it's a good question, right? I'm sure there's limitations. I would just like maybe kind of tease that out for a second. On the surface, I think, yeah, there's a couple feature limitations and I don't have like a whole memory of each one, but generally I'd say there's like a couple- I'm sure I would get in there, start making a song and be like, oh, can you do this super specific thing? And it would be like, no, they don't have that feature. And then that would be frustrating. But generally speaking, I think I, I think I could use like one thing is, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this and maybe GarageBand has it and I just don't know, but Ableton like snaps everything to a grid. And so like, you know, people talk about like being on grid in music, which is, you know, or quantitized, which is just when that when you let the computer take the notes if you just played it on a keyboard let's say and there's like tiny mistakes you can quantize it to a certain tempo i suppose and like it'll basically perfect it That's like mathematically crazy. you know what i mean it'll basically like if i played da 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 and there was like the timing was off on da 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 then it would just like straighten it out and fix That's, it you know seriously but whenever you i mean that's like that's not an Ableton specific feature, but I'm just saying like, that shows you how little, like I know what goes on (laughs) under the hood. No, you're good. But all that to say, like the other piece that comes along with that, the whole uh, grid thing I was mentioning is that like you take your, you let, whether it's drums or some 
chords on a piano sound or synth or something, you take those sounds and, and you can like snap, you can easily drag the files of, of different instrument sounds around your session and it will evenly like, I'm not doing a great job describing this. It will evenly snap section by section. So if you're in a four, four time, like one, two, three, four, right? Like everything is going to be, it's, it will, you can either turn that snap feature on or off where it's like everything will perfectly slide into place. So you can slide it over and it won't be like right before the start of the downbeat, but off, it's not going to let you do that. It's going to just like perfectly drag it to the onbeat. The problem of that, of course, is you sometimes have to go in and humanize your music by like putting things off of that grid and making it feel more or natural. And a lot of people do that, but I just butchered that description. If any like producers listening, they're like, that's very poor, poor description of that. But essentially just the ability to like the organization of the tool, the ability to the flow of your song and snapping everything to the grid easily. That makes sense. And then to be honest, like the Ableton specific features, uh, a lot of them have to do with like live performances, like I mentioned. And so I haven't really tapped into a lot of those features around sure. like timing and yeah, just a lot of features that I haven't gotten into on the live performance side. But for me, it just comes down to how easy the tool has been to use and the fact that I've learned it now because, you know, just like if I had to give a note to myself like two years ago or even till still today, honestly, it's like just spending time like learning how to use that program would is so valuable even today for me because it saves me hours in a moment when I need to know something. So like just investing in the keyboard shortcuts to learn how to access different settings or switch between views or like fix something super specific. There'd be times where like the most stupid thing would take me three hours or a couple of days to figure out. And so then it would kill a whole session when we were trying to do something and I just didn't know how to do it. And so I think there's an aspect of just like, if you invest time in learning the tool then, you know, you might not actually do better if you switch to a higher quality, more expensive tool. Like if you just know yours better. Nice. You know that's I mean? good. And that's yeah, literally that's really just me speaking to myself right now because I could probably continue to invest in Ableton. I know there's still tons of stuff I haven't uncovered. Yeah, that makes total sense. And actually, plug for our next episode, we're going to be talking about developing things over time and the patience that accompanies our next episode. So tune back in. Is there a... There might be a better way than tune. No one really tunes in anymore. Click on it. <laughs> Download this. Uh, yeah, to yeah. Listen at your convenience. No, but dude, that makes sense. I mean, it's something that you really, really know. I mean, that's good. you're going to be mm. better with that tool than you might be with something that you don't know that's even of a higher quality. I think that's a good point. The other one that I had, just to kind of keep us clipping away here, was the just pencil and paper, specifically the Blackwing 602 pencil. Mm. Shout out to those of you who are Blackwing fans. It's an awesome pencil. I mean, does it does it have a big advantage over the Ticonderoga number two? The answer is yes, but you can certainly use why. <laughs> I like oh yeah yeah yeah. I, the graphite I think is just a better quality. It's a lot smoother to write with. Mm. Um, nice. That's one thing that I really like about them. But anyway, the main reason I have them is Steinbeck used them. That was his go-to, the Blackwing 602. So that was kind of a geeky thing. But the more Pretty serious part was I really, I don't do any so any sort of like creative writing that I do poetry-wise, any, any sort of poetry that I'm working on, I never use my laptop. I never use a word processor. I always use mm. paper. It slows me down. I can cross out a bunch of stuff. I can strike things right in little tiny parts of the paper. Like I always go back to paper and pencil when I'm writing any sort of poetry. And then I transfer that because it's just not the same in trying to hit the meter and rhyme and these sort of things when I'm working. I just really like to use tactile pencil and paper. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. I, are there any things like that for you? Like, is there a certain task that you like using a certain tool for? Because, I mean, obviously I'm not long handwriting papers. That would be a pain in the butt. But for like that task specifically, I really like this tool. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh man, I don't know. The other tools, I wrote down a couple things. I wrote down 
my these headphones I'm wearing. What is the brand? Bear Dynamic. Is that right? Yeah, Bear Dynamic DT770 Pro. And these are the 80 ohm, which I think they make different levels of ohms. So that's the only reason I said that. But yeah, these headphones, which are actually technically works, they're not mine, but they are just, I, they're really comfortable and I can wear them for like four hours and be comfortable with that. They don't hurt my head or my ears and they have a really clean sound. They're not ultimately the best for mixing because they don't have very much bass response at all and they're really quiet. So you have to like crank your volume to get the same volume out of them as you would for a normal pair of headphones, but I really do like them. And so that's not really an answer to your question. The other thing I wrote down was my guitar, which I've kind of fallen off from playing if I'm honest, but that's probably my analog tool. And it's an electric guitar, so it's not really analog, but like that's my sit down with really any guitar. It's like sit down and just play chords, come up with ideas, just noodle, you know, just different melody ideas, chord progressions, whatever. So I think that's probably my sort of equivalent of like just sitting down, slowing down to write. So here's a, here's a question for you in the same sort of way. Do you have electric plugged in effects on when you're working or do you just, are you just strumming without anything? Sometimes it's, yeah, honestly. So for me, whenever I'm like just trying to come up with ideas like this week, I've had a few times where I just wanted to sit down and make a new beat, mess around, just have fun. And that looks like me getting my laptop, plugging in a external hard drive with, my samples on it, like drum sounds and vocal sounds and different synths and whatever. And then, uh, plugging in my headphones and then maybe plugging in my guitar, which I haven't done this week, but I could do that. And I do like having effects on, I like, you know, making the guitar have a specific sound that I really like putting a bunch of reverb on it, maybe like whatever the tone is or vibe that I'm going for. And then just, that's my blank canvas, but it's just different because I'm making something digital, you know? And so. For sure. Those are good. Those are good tools. Yeah, man. Love Hard it. pivot. We pivot in. Yeah. So I guess, well, what is your next piece of this flow is an application. So I'm kind of curious what you think the application is for. Yeah. Maybe just even speaking to me, like what's the application for me with creative tools? Well, I don't know if mine will be really profound at all. I have written down, identify a tool. And so I think it's helpful to be mindful of the tools that you're using. This was a conversation I had with actually my students here at the end of the semester. of like, just be mindful, like where you're working, when you're working, what you're using. Like, is the writing experience different when you're, you know, typing versus when you're writing longhand? Mm -hmm. I mean, not a lot of people are writing longhand, but that idea of like being mindful, like, do you like to write in a Google document? Do you like to write on Microsoft Word? Like that, there's difference. Like there's different experiences with that. What, mm -hmm. you know, typeface or font do you like to use? Like just being mindful mm -hmm. of the tools that you're using, I think is a great step because then that you kind of can reflect on that and be like, okay, is this helpful? Like, is this conducive to what I'm trying to yeah. do? I think I've heard writers say like sometimes when they're stuck or something, they'll put like a super goofy font on and then type with that. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. I don't think I've, I don't think I've tried that, but like things like that, like just try to be mindful and like identify what tools that you're using and in kind of a different way, like are you using any gadgets or as Crouch would say devices, like how do you use those? So that's what I had, just kind of being cognizant, try to identify a tool or one or two that you're using and maybe reflect on that. I like that. I think what another application that has been spinning in my head from a friend recently mentioning this to me when I was telling him I wasn't inspired. He said, you know, something that could be really useful whenever you're feeling that way is to limit your tools. And so for him, that meant reducing down to a, oh gosh, what's it called? Medium format camera, I think, which I believe has no zoom and photographers don't come at me. I don't know all these things, but I think that's right. And it was like reducing down to like, I'm only going to shoot film on this one camera can't zoom, can't change lenses. Very cool. And I'm only, and then you can restrict yourself even more. I'm only going to shoot this specific category of photos or I'm only going to, you know, so good. do it at a certain time of day and like setting those limits then a lot. Like for me, a production idea could be only make a song with my voice or 
only make a song with just guitar, like no drums or like, you know, just like limiting the number of effects that I'm allowed to use or the number of channels in my in Ableton. Like I can only use 10 channels. How can I make those 10 channels make something really great? So I think that that is something that I should, that I might revisit, you know, just to rekindle some inspiration sometime soon. Dude, that's great. I really like that. I mean, I think that goes back to something we really didn't mention too, of like tools can be, there can be too many and it can right. be like distractions and you can go a hundred different places. And that a lot of people that I, producers, audio engineers that I respect have really sh- taught me from a distance that like you don't necessarily need a new EQ plugin. Like you might get a different tone out of another one. It's not going to make you a better producer. You need to just practice the using the this, this stock tools in your in Ableton. That's all you need. You you don't have to go spend hundreds of dollars to get a better sound. Just learning how to do something better can really like strengthen you. So great. Yeah, man. That's good. Quote um, of the week. Let's close it off with a quote of the week. Or day. I think I'm gonna put a little sound right before this. We'll see. Quote of the week. To the quote of the week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So today's quote comes from uh which one am I reading? I have like five five quotes on this because it was so good. And I'm going to read this one from Natalie Goldberg. It says, choose, choose your tools carefully, but not so carefully that you get uptight or spend more time at the stationary store than at your writing table. I'll say it one more time. Choose your tools carefully, but not so carefully that you get uptight or spend more time at the stationary store than at your writing table. I love it. That's a good little benediction. Choose your tools wisely. <laughs> That's right. I feel like it, I mean, we kind of already covered that idea. So there's not really much to expound on, but. But yeah, that's a middle, that's the middle position, man. Choose your, choose your tools wisely. They don't, you know, they are not everything, but they do matter. Choose them wisely. I mean, I, I think that's a, that's, that's a good it. takeaway, I think, from the conversation. That's all she wrote. Thanks for listening. And I think that's all we got today. Any final thoughts, Carter? I got nothing. All right. Well, we'll see you guys in the next episode where we talk about artistic patience. Make sure to check it out. It'll be coming out two weeks after this episode drops on a Wednesday morning. So we'll see you then. Hey, thanks for listening to The Craft with Carter and Colby, where we share what we're learning about the creative process. If you're a writer, music producer, marketer, filmmaker, photographer, or you just love creativity, then this show is for you. Our cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewelldesign.com. That's elizabeth, N-E-W-E-L-L, design.com. And you can follow her on Instagram at elizabethisadesigner. If you like the show, there's three things you can do to help us out. First, subscribe so you learn when we post new episodes. Second, send the link to one of your friends who you think would enjoy the show. Uh, Really, word of mouth is going to be the the number one way we grow the show in any way. And three, if you have a topic you want us to cover or feedback about how we can improve the show or comments on what we've said, you can respond to heycraftpodcast at gmail.com, H-E-Y-C-R-A-F-T podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.